Almost ready. Let me see. Yes, yes. Do, 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 the, do the screen share. And, but I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you. Just give me two seconds. I just need. Sí, que se va, se va bien, ¿no? Bien, ¿no? I mean, let's just let's just go with this one. And if they can't hear, then they will complain and fix it. Right? Let's, go, let's go with this one. <laughs> so, hello, hello, Johanna. Can you hear us? Or someone in the Zoom meeting, can you wave or thumbs up? We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So. Let's, let's go this way. I think there might be a, an interference with the recording audio, but I think it's better to not, not stretch it longer. Yeah. Sir, anyway, <laughs> thank you for waiting and being patient. Uh, thank you for, or congratulations for making it through the first day. Uh, we're in the final session. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but this is what's promised to be like this. So, um, so uh, we have very, very nice refreshments that uh, can be provided by Mars there, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, yes, so I, I just very briefly would say that I'm very, very excited to have this particular contribution because it is uh, representative of something that I've been trying to make happen, and these people here have known me for years here in Valencia, that I wanted to have art much more explicitly integrated in the center dance. So I think you got some dose of art, literature, and uh, the workshops and other things that are going to happen, but this is a very uh, sort of formally artistic uh, and scientific sort of combination. Or I so, please, Mark, just take it. Away. Yes. Thank you, Carlos. Um, yeah, that was amazing to hear Stephen Wolfram, and uh, I think uh, uh, we're going to keep it light. There will be no ruly ads here. Even <laughs> though I love them. So, um, we're very happy to be here. Me uh, representing Our Ciencia. We are a new journal project that is based between Denmark and the US, and it's edited by me and Johanna Owen that you will meet in a little in a second. Um, and we got in touch with uh, Sam, that just having been in touch online before, and then got the invitation to come here and present this, which we are very happy for. We come from, uh, let's say, the art world in many ways, but also are, are interdisciplinary practitioners. I'm a uh, dropout biologist, a um, little bit of philosopher, and otherwise work a lot on the theoretical basis of interdisciplinarity, as well as infrastructural development of art and science collaborations in various different organizations. And Art Ciencia is one of these new, fresh things that is coming out uh, late, um, lately in our 
Um, and it's great to be here because like art and science has certain scripts that it follows and there are some things we want to do differently and this is our proposal and how we want to do it differently. And then the basic outline, we want to not to have art as illustrating scientific facts after the, they've been produced, but we want artistic and aesthetic concerns to be a part of the scientific trajectory. And in a similar vein, in another, in the inverse motion, we want um, aesthetic, um, aesthetic and art to not be overdetermined by all the indeterminacies that get projected onto subjectivity per se. Uh, but that's proved that art can be formalized and there is a uh, purpose in formalizing art to some degree in certain, certain cases. Um, so what will happen now is that I would just like read the foreword, uh, the editorial foreword of this. Uh, we'll scroll through a little bit. It's going to be an online. We're actually not done with the uh, design entirely. So on Wednesday, you will be able to download this beautiful piece. Um, it's still, uh, it's just lagged behind slightly, but we're very happy on Wednesday to present it because we will also host a workshop on Wednesday. Um, that will uh, interactively engage with these concerns that we're raising here. Um, there will be a short reading by uh, Johanna on Alex Boland's piece, Narrative Engineering, it's called, um, as well as a reading by Giovanna Maksic, uh, calling in from Belgrade uh, in Serbia. Um, and uh, it will end with just a short little uh, exit on the piece I read for the general. So the foreword goes like this. For the first issue of Art Ciencia, we have focused on the raw space where art and science overlaps. Art and science are often overdetermined by their disciplinary forms, yet concerns of aesthetics and analytics are unwaveringly, unwaveringly cooperative within the specific pipelines of knowledge and feeling that art and science constitute. In focusing on the raw synthetic space between art and science, we are divesting from the nominally collaborative and its false promise of constructing a total collection of knowledge. Instead, the raw forecloses this preemptive technocratic frame and re reinvests in a simple twofold motion the formalization of artistic practice and the figuration of scientific inquiry. Quote, more delicate than the stem that carries now a wondrous growth. Enchanted is the eye. In, 19, in 1790, Goethe offered the prefiguration of what later came to be known as homology, that is, the development of similar anatomical features from the same evolutionary structural script. His method was to render intimate the formal tools of romantic poetics with the perceptual capacities of the human observer. As an example of the rawness that we hope to, that can permeate this first issue of Arciencia, Going back to Goethe's method reinstills an emphasis on discovery, not as inherently tied to expansion or technological advancement, but as a formalization of the interface between psyche and world, between appearance and analysis. And at a point in time where computational and infrastructural pressures are forcing many scientific disciplines into an egregoric game of inferential evidence and contemporary scientific, uh, artistic discourse, is exiting the domains of comprehensibility and criticizability outside of its own closed feedback loops. We look for the handles that carry clarity, expressivity, and that are motorized by a productive illusion of a unity to come. Um, so yeah, let's scroll a little bit. Um, here is the cover. Here is Amitai Rom's uh, back cover. We have a... Um, um, a letter from the editors. Here is Chandra Ersalan's Cantaloupe. She's making an oracle game based on plant cognition. That's really cool. Um, here is Amitai's further work. It looks amazing, right? I love this one. Just finished today's session with my slanoscope, it says. And this one, this is a collage made by Johanna. It also looks pretty amazing in my opinion. It's a painting by Moselle K from New York and some uh, drawings by Amitai as well. Here's some further pictures by Moselle. Um, Petros Lales um, 
uh, reimagines photography as a non-human form of uh, leaving traces behind and therefore maybe kind of challenging the very necessity of a distinction between objectivity and subjectivity. Um, Alexander Boland's narrative engineering is our longest piece. Um, it's uh, entering into the tradition of uh, poets, engineers by Reza Negaristani or thinker doers by Chakandeska Matanga Mahunga. Um, and here is my piece um, that speaks about what maps in higher dimensional, what does maps need to be able to do for our navigation in higher dimensional space? Um, so how does these higher dimensional representational forms look from an aesthetic point of view? Basically, Tisney, the dimensionality reduction aesthetics. Um, and then we have also um, um, Ama Triganitsa, Chiara Salmini, and Magnus, Christian Hernandez Blick, uh, Ch Sara Chefka, um, Merk Dilkimas, and Carlo Carnevale uh, in this issue as well. Okay, so that's the intro. Now we're going to listen to say hi to Johanna, who is calling in from um, Deja de Compartie. Yes. I, I wanted to swap to Johanna. Um, who is calling in from Ashland, Oregon, I believe. Oh. If you unmute yourself, no. Anna, I think you, you'll be no, able to. Um, jo Johanna. First. Yeah, 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 yeah. Johanna. I think if she speaks, you will go. Hello. It's yeah. going to be Johanna. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. Hi, Johanna. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Uh, yeah, so my name is Johanna Owen. I am a biology yeah. and math here in Oregon. And uh, I have a longer history uh, in the art world. I started um, a public radio show when I was 11 years old um, that played a lot of, like, like, not explicit music, but like music that adults listen to. And uh, I was also writing songs and performing them. And, and I kind of was this, like, uh, semi homeless like art world drifter for a long time before I decided to um, to study biology and um, so the you know intersection of uh, art and science are are uh, obviously very fundamental to my life um, and I'm really happy to uh, be presenting at Seth's huge honor. Um, uh, so, I guess, man, did you just want me to go right into reading some of Alex's piece from here? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to read a short excerpt from Alexander Boland's piece, um, which I, examines the uh, theory and models from the point of engineering and um, kind of talks about the uh, relativity that is uh, inherent to engineering. Um, so this section of the essay is called Models. The fundamental concept of information theory, a field of applied math developed by Claude Shannon to theorize about the line of communication, is compression. To compress something is to describe it with less data. Some compression is lossy, such as when you take music from a vinyl record and turn it into an MP3. The basic information is still present, but there is a loss of detail. In cases where no details are truly lost, the compression is lossless, which we will focus on for now. Considering the following string of binary digits, we can see this on the screen that Mandis is sharing, one string is just all ones, and this one is some kind of alternating sequence of zeros and ones. So which one of these would take more space to describe? With the former, you can just say, repeat the number one 18 times. But what about the latter? 
Of course, there might be some way to make the description of the former sequence shorter, but you see what I can do. A mathematical theory called Kolmogorov complexity deals with exactly this subject by asking, what is the smallest computer program that I can write that would output this? Such a computer program constitutes a model. A more general way of imagining compression without having to think about computers is the concept of a homomorphism. Imagine any number of objects that are related to each other in certain ways. To create a homomorphism, you create a new group consisting of some, but not necessarily all, of those objects, such that the objects in this new group still have the same relationships to one another that they did in the old group. In more general terms, it consists of creating a smaller version of something that has the exact same structure. A simple example of a homomorphism is the sentence hand on an analog clock. Imagine one that takes every sentence and one that makes takes that are twice as big every two seconds. The former makes more fine-grained movements, but they both still tell time accurately. More importantly, you can convert the movements of the more fine-grained clock to the movements of the coarser clock without losing their structure. But what do I mean by structure? In the case of clocks, any two movements of the second hand on a clock can be added into a new movement. In the case of a single tick for every second, adding 10 ticks to 30 type ticks is the equivalent of advancing 40 ticks. And, adv and adding 30 ticks to 50 ticks is the equivalent of advancing 20 ticks, since the hand goes in a cycle of 60 seconds. I can do the same for the other more coarse clock, except in this case the hand goes in a cycle of 30 seconds, which, add, which changes the rules of addition, but only superficially. Because if I take any two movements from the coarse clock and add them together before switching to the fine clock, it will be exactly the same as converting both movements to the measurements of the fine clock and then adding them together here. This property is also known as congruence, which may be familiar from grade school geometry. A model that is congruent with its subject is one that is capable of anticipating its behavior. Why is this? Consider how you can tell how much time will pass with even a relatively coarse clock. It will not get out of sync with the more fine clock if we disregard the effects of relativity for the moment. Similarly, a model that treats a subject in a more coarse manner will not fall out of sync with the subject it is modeling, so long as there is congruence. In this case, it would not matter which of the two paths are chosen to get from the top left corner to the bottom right corner of the diagram below. And this diagram is shown on the screen there. Here, the downward arrow on the right is essentially a prediction about how the actual thing on the top left will change. If the prediction were inaccurate, then taking the left-hand arrow, watching the object change, and then applying the bottom arrow, encoding the changed object, would provide a different result than first taking the top arrow, encoding the original object into your model, and then using the model on the encoding, applying the model's prediction. If, on the other hand, the predictions reliably come true, then there is congruence between the model and the subject being modeled, where, just like the example of the clocks, the finer phenomena can be converted into the coarser phenomena and then computed, and the results would be the same as working within the former, and only in the end converting it into the latter. In category theory, a diagram that achieves this lack of path dependence is said to commute, and an encoding such as the one shown above is called a functor. Of course, the problem is that a model can appear to be congruent until it doesn't. Like when Lawrence found that the version of the simulation that will use three digits after the decimal point was not congruent with the one that used six, or when the gambler suddenly loses his touch. So I'll just say that I think it's really exciting to have this kind of uh, science communication, philosophy, kind of writing interspersed with what would and otherwise be a, an art journal, and combining those um, those spaces of discussion. Uh, so yeah, thank you for letting us share. Um, thank you, Johanna. Um, shall we, uh, Giovanna? Are you with us? Yeah. Hi. Hello, everyone. So, should I start, Manus? Uh, one second. One, one second. Then you will be on. Okay. 
you are on. This is Giovanna oh. calling from Belgrade. Hi, I'm here calling from Serbia. Um, so thank you to Magnus and Johanna for inviting me to do this little reading. Um, I'm happy to, to participate. Um, so just a very quick intro and bio. I studied neuroscience and uh, more recently primatology. And broadly I'm interested in human and non-human primates, how we communicate um, and how we behave um, in social settings. Recently I've also been dabbling in the arts, um, working in the trust space in Berlin. Um, and here is where I kind of developed some of my interest in animism, cybernetics, etc. So the following essay um, that I wrote that's in our Scientia is called Life and Death on Monkey Island, Ambiguous Lessons for Humanity. And a little bit of setting for this is that I conducted field work last year in Puerto Rico, where I worked at the Cayo Santiago research station with uh, macaque monkeys. So this essay kind of encapsulates my own relationship to them. Um, and with this, I'm going to start reading. It's one of those painfully sunny days in the Caribbean. I'm wearing thick, hiking pants, protective eye and headwear, my boots covered in mud, skin covered in SPF 50. Today I need to collect samples from the rebel group, TT. According to my research crew, TT split off from the main families and now inhabits the island's peak, surrounded by steep cliffs and very little shade. The climb is difficult, not only because of the scorching heat, but also because of the creeping feeling of being watched. Hundreds of eyes are following my steps, assessing my confidence, looking for signs of fear. If you are nervous, the monkeys will know. If you are afraid, the monkeys will know. If you try too hard to mimic confidence, the monkeys will know. You have to detach yourself from the fear of dying. It is the only way to mark your position in this hierarchy. In the 1930s, an American primatologist named Clarence Carpenter envisioned a project unlike anything in the history of science. With his team, he shipped several hundred rhesus macaques from India to a tiny island in the Caribbean. The goal was to establish an independent monkey colony on an island devoid of humans, other than scientists. The research site would become the first natural laboratory of its kind, where monkeys would live their social lives unrestrained, yet under strict scientific supervision, and with food provided by the research program. For almost a hundred years, this well-kept secret colony has provided insights into the deepest questions of our primate heritage. Entering TT territory, I am now surrounded by hundreds of feral macaques shoving monkey chow down their throats. I see low-ranking individuals picking up scraps left by the alphas and their subordinates. Loner weirdos trying to steal a piece or two while no one's looking. A venture occasionally unnoticed, yet potentially punishable by facial disfigurement by a gang of angry females. Not bad. Macaque society operates on strict social hierarchies. Millions of years of natural selection and behavioral machinery resulted in chaotic, highly effective dominant structures. There is no mercy in macaque society. Not even for infants who face equally ungodly acts of violence. As a human bystander, I cannot deny my deeply rooted visceral reactions to these confusing acts of violence. But then again, who am I to judge? They have lived on this planet longer than all of us. My task on the island is to collect and store monkey excreta, which are then shipped to a lab in New York City. 
This means I have to stay close to my targeted individuals or vocals. Each monkey has its own code, which is really hard to remember. So we simply give them names. My personal favorite is Willem the Folk. Mm -hmm. To identify a monkey, I need to recognize its face, body, any deformities or injuries, its family members, friends, enemies, and of course, its personality. Knowing a monkey is like knowing a person. But while humans tend to actively seek out eye contact, macaques see it as a literal declaration of violence. If you stare into the eyes of a macaque for longer than two seconds, be prepared to witness an array of stunningly demonic faces. Even without direct provocation, you may find yourself becoming a victim of something I like to call macaque side channel attacks. Certain provocateurs will spend a good amount of time studying your behavior and will often go unnoticed. You will only get to know their true intentions when the time is right. Not to say that all macaques are psychopaths, some of them are actually really nice, but one thing is certain, macaque society is violent. TT is on the edge today. A group of elders hides under a thin metal roof, one of them remaining human constructs after Hurricane Maria. There's not much personal space, and infants just can't seem to stop moving around. As I walk past the structure, a pair of phantom hands grabs an infant's leg, pulling it deeper into the shade. A mother on guard. Suddenly, I hear a loud bang, and then another one. I turn to the roof and lock eyes with the hormonal juvenile, jumping on the metal with all its brute force. Its body wide open, hoping to invite some trouble. The elders don't seem to care at all, though. By now, they have seen it all. These mindless bursts of aggression and dominance displays are treated as rites of passage, so to say. Some days are worse than others, however. For example, when long periods of famine strike, all hell breaks loose on Monkey Island. During World War II, the monkeys were left unfed for months, which forced them to venture out into the ocean to search for alternative sources of food. Being excellent swimmers, these hungry macaques reached the shores of civilization wreaking havoc on anything or anyone who crossed their path. Oddly enough, the descendants of these ballsy macaques still live scattered on the mainland today. Sightings have been reported every year in both urban and rural areas. One particularly alluring city vandal is the monkey of Santurce, El Mono de Santurce who became an internet celebrity overnight and fueled an entire rabbit hole of monkey memes. Naturally, people enjoyed witnessing this realistic return to monkey moment. But what exactly should we return to? Are we really willing to stare down into the deep evolutionary past and face it? Many of us are still in denial of our violent, primate nature. Deeper in TT territory, I am now at the highest point of the island. I see a lone monkey going down the cliff and I decide to follow him. Judging by his body posture, he is about to leave a fresh sample of stool, so I concentrate my efforts on him. The decline is steep, but I am determined. I tell myself that maybe in 200 years, humanity will benefit from this minuscule act of courage or stupidity. The monkey starts climbing a tree. The stool is right there in front of me, so close to the edge. If I lose my balance now, I might slip down. Foolishly, I rush down to collect the stool and stumble onto a tree trunk. From this moment on, seconds turn to minutes and everything slows down. All I see are sharp canines inches away from my face. It looks like I startled two sleeping TT males. They're huge and they're angry. 
I can almost smell their breath. For a split second, my body shuts down, but my brain is anticipating the incoming pain. Luckily, I managed to grab a rock on the ground and throw it in their direction. They back off, but they're not done yet. Being chased by fear of macaques is not an option right now, so I embrace the moment. I bow my head, open my mouth, and give my best demonic grace. That's it. wonderful reading and um, it also comes with images um, in the journal, some mm -hmm. lovely memes uh, <laughs> that you could smell. <laughs> um, to finish off, I will read a two-minute uh, excerpt from my text that is here. Um, and it goes something like this. Perhaps a molecule, this is just going to be like a little sneak peek, let's say, yeah. Uh, so cartoids does not tell us how things look as such, but it exists as liminal representations. Uh, sorry, this is the image. Uh, but exists as liminal representations what, between what instrumentality, aesthetics, and representation do. In this way, the cartoid is less a claim onto a rigorous relation between phenomena and representation thereof, but facilitates the relation between component of the work of navigation and externalized in the structure of representation as a response to the fundamental unmappability of the phenomena, in this case about the dimensionality, dimensionality reduction into two dimensions. To recall Anne-Francois Schmitt again, this can only be see a, seen as a response to how we can constructively act in the space of necessary subtraction that the n-dimensionality of contemporary integrative objects poses. Instead of marveling at the complexity of this scenario or reifying the consequential unknowability, the labor we are facing is to systematize the unknowability, or as in the case of dimensionality reduction, fold the error back into the image. Um, and so, uh, on Wednesday we will facilitate a little workshop on uh, how to, uh, how we think about, uh, together with you, try to locate some examples where aesthetics and analysis are interchangeable. And we believe this is happening all the time, but there are certain points in scientific and artistic trajectories where this is like more tangible than other points. So we're going to look for those points uh, in an hour session. Maybe like, I was going to say outside, but I realized that it might make the even quarter outside. So. <laughs> we'll uh, see yeah. what the yeah. heat wave we'll, brings. We'll find out. Um, <laughs> but uh, please also on Wednesday, uh, come back and download the journal and spread the word. And we are also very open for the next issue for developing work together with you guys or people that will be interested in working along these lines and want to know more about how we do the editorial processes and uh, want, would like to contribute as well. Um, and we have a Telegram channel. It's R C N C A on Telegram, where we post some stuff. Uh, so follow that one as well. And otherwise, it's rcnc.online. <laughs> That's it. Very good. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you for taking this to the lab. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you, everyone on the other side, for your contributions. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for the first day. That was the end. So we made it.